welcome. The Lord is here, and it is good to worship God with you this morning. We're glad you came to Ann Street today. Please take a moment and pass the attendance pad down your pew and sign it. If you are a visitor, we're especially glad that you are here and hope that you will feel at home. God is at work at Ann Street. And so I want to share just a few announcements. Every time we tell you to please carefully read, I don't think I have ever looked at the bulletin and have found more announcements that were very important because there is a lot going on in our church as we gear up for the new year. I want to call your attention to just a few quick ones. First of all, I know everyone has watched television, they've seen everything going on on the Texas coast, Louisiana coast, and everybody wants to help in some way. But I cannot encourage you enough to make your donations to help the people through UMCOR. UMCOR is through the Methodist Church. Every penny you contribute goes straight to people. The administration is already paid for by the Methodist Church, so every penny goes to help. So I would encourage you, if you are thinking about donating, that please remember the Methodist UMCOR. Second of all, I want to remind everybody, you may have seen signs posted out um, by the drawbridge. September 16th, we are holding a health fair this is free, it's open to everyone in the community, so invite your friends. We will have representatives, um, friendly care, um, from the different hospice groups, um, different medical groups, everything you can imagine. And a bounce house. <laughs> and a bounce house. Um, well, I guess that keeps children healthy. Um, <laughs> But like I said, this is a community event, so please spread the word and invite your friends and neighbors to come join us. Another very important announcement is in the bulletin, it talks about the children's choirs we're having this year. Children's choir starts this Wednesday for children in grades three through five to ride on the bus from Beaufort Elementary you must fill out a permission slip. These are located um, in the table by the back door. So any parents that want their children to be picked up by the church and brought here for um, children's choir, please fill out this permission slip um, so they can ride the bus. Now, if you are able, please rise and join me in our call to worship. In mutual compassion and authentic love, we gather as the family of God. We offer our gifts, our hope, and our lives to build up this community of faith. We bring our songs of gratitude and joy to bless God with our worship and praise. God has given us peace and fellowship. Let us take a moment now to share with these with one another, followed by our hymn 156, I Love to Tell the Story. Um, during the last stanza of the hymn, children may come forward for the children's sermon. So let's share love and peace with each other.
may be seated. <coughs> Good morning. I'm glad to see you all this morning. What holiday are we celebrating this weekend? Do you know what it is? What? Um, Labor Day? Labor Day. Why do we celebrate Labor Day? That's right. We honor all of the people who work with hard jobs and give everybody a day off to rest and relax and be with their family. Okay, I want to show you a few things people who work might have. Now, who might wear something like this? Um, a policeman. It's similar to a policeman hat. These are military hats. So someone in the Army or Navy might wear those. They're the ones who are protecting our country, and they wear those every day. Okay. Who might have this? A doctor. A doctor or a nurse. Okay. An artist or somebody painting your house. A paint. Very good. Oh, you are really on the ball today. Okay. I've got a toothbrush, toothpaste. Who might use this? A dentist. A dentist, yes. Absolutely, or oh, maybe an electrician or plumber might need those. A chef. Ooh. A chef, oh good. Oh, someone that cooks and, okay, how about a bunch of these books? <coughs> Who might use books? Librarian. Okay, how about school teachers? These are actually school books. Okay, do you think we have enough teachers and policemen and painters and doctors? Yes. Yeah, we have right many. But now Jesus had an important thing that he told his disciples. He talked about the kingdom of God. And he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send out more workers. So if we are going to be workers for God or workers for Jesus, what might we need? What might be the tools we would use? Okay, how about a Bible? A Bible. So we can tell other people, the good, just like the hymn we just sang, we can tell other people the story about Jesus. We might want that. Let's see, another way we might help, another tool we might have. Pennies. Okay, well, we got money, so we can, we can donate to help people like after the hurricane or other things that we can reach out to help people. Let's see another thing we might use. Cans. Cans of food. We have food drives, or you may know people, particularly after the hurricane, that might need lots of food, or, or just maybe a neighbor that you're sharing a meal with, or something like that. So we want to all try to be workers for God. And these are the things we use. You can use things as simple as a smile, a nice word to people at school, but there are many ways that you can be a worker for God. So let us pray. Lord, help us to be good workers in your kingdom. Make us bold to share the good news of Jesus and make us loving that we might share God's love. Thank you. Amen. I'm glad you all were with us this morning.
hear now the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life, or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, And then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. Thank you. This is the second in a sermon series of four about uh, some of the instructions in the middle of Romans that Paul gives to the church. And so I hope you'll uh, follow along or listen to as, and hear these words. This from Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil. But why don't you say the last part with me? Overcome evil with good. Is that the word of God for the people of God? Yes. Thanks be to God, indeed. Uh, last week I shared a, a book. Uh, it just so happens that this week I want to mention another one, not one that you probably have to put on your reading list, although uh, he wouldn't mind. The, the author is a friend of mine, and uh, it's not widely, um, it's not a, a big international bestseller like, like last week. It's just a, a cute little book called The Unofficial United Methodist Handbook. And it's full of some nice things about, you know, our history and our, a little bit of kind of what you need to know if you're uh, kind of wanting to know more about this denomination, this tradition. But it's got a few funny uh, tongue-in-cheek little passages. And they're like rules, you know, so there's little short chapters. Uh, there's one, top ten Bible villains or top ten Bible heroes or seven funniest Bible stories. So cute stuff. But then he's also got some like, how to respond when someone sits in your pew. (laughs) 
And he says, if Christian, he first tells you, you know, just sit somewhere else. I mean, get over it, right? <laughs> but then he goes on, and, and he knows, he kind of plays laughing at ourselves. He says, if hospitality is not in your virtues, then stand at the end of the pew with your arms folded and tell them that uh, God might not be able to find you if you don't sit in that seat this day. <laughs> or elsewhere, we have uh, something about the footwear for the acolyte. Poor Hannah doesn't have to worry about that today. It's when some of the acolytes get the light-up shoes on the back, you know. And he said, at least if you're going to wear light-up shoes as an acolyte, match the color of the pyramids with the light of your shoes. And the offering plate, he says. It, it's not a, the bag that they pass you up and down the aisle on an airplane for your little trash. You know, please don't put your gum wrappers in the offering plate. Cute stuff. One of the best, though, is if you've come... Uh, from a long Saturday night, having a little uh, more fun than you uh, had rest, uh, then when you come to church and you, sleepiness starts to overtake you, uh, just make sure that when you doze that you don't put your head front, put it back. Because then when you wake up, commit to yourself that you're going to say amen when you wake up, and everybody's going to think you were praying the whole time. And he calls these kind of Methodist manners. But I thought of them when I look back over these, this list of um, instructions that Paul gives in this text. Uh, they're like, well, preacher Brett Younger has called them a mismanners guide for being a Christian, being the church. And we're saying in this series that we're seeing that Paul has some really important things to say to the church in Rome that apply to us uh, as well, and, and all churches he says that this is giving like an etiquette column for the church. Moral advice is good, but this is not just mere moralism. Uh, uh, well, you could get that from a lot of places. Uh, you could get that from an etiquette column, or you could get it from uh, self-help gurus. This is something different. This is a way of seeing the world the way Jesus did. Living in the world the way Jesus did. Paul's pretty pretty intentional about helping us see that. So like any organization that has rules, we, we govern ourselves, and we Methodists have all these things, you know, when we've got the uh, discipline and we've got the uh, rules of, of order. But what really makes us a church is not those things. It's not the committees and the structure. Those are vehicles to help us be effective disciples in the world. This is what makes us a church. Why don't we hear those, those rules again, but this time in a variety of voices, in our own voices, and I've asked some to lead us and, and share those with us. Listen again to these. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These are the codes of behavior for the church. Uh, uh, this is how we know what we do and who we are. Take, for example, the one where Paul says, Outdo one another in showing honor. How countercultural is that? No sports team would come out and say, all right, we're going to hit the field and we're going to show honor to the other team and we're going to show more honor than the other team did, right? How countercultural, how strange, how interesting and amazing. What about bless those who persecute you? What's our natural response? To bless those who persecute you? No, sue them, right? If your enemies are hungry, 
feed them. Enemies, folks, enemies, not just the hungry. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Wait a minute, I don't think they teach that in the war college, you know. If your enemies, uh, then you should try to cut off the supply lines so they don't have food and drink. What is this strange thing? Abraham Lincoln grasped this radical way when he said something to the effect of, do I not conquer my enemy by making him my friend? Barbara Brown Taylor has commented about this very passage and said, there is nothing sentimental or the least bit easy about any of this. There's not even a guarantee that it will work. But one thing is for sure. When we repay evil with evil, evil is all there is in bigger and more toxic piles. The only way to reverse the process is to behave in totally unexpected ways, blessing the persecutor, feeding the hungry, the enemy rather, embracing the bully, breaking the vicious cycle, and refusing to participate in it anymore. One of Christianity's earliest critics was the Greek philosopher Celsus. And by the year 177, Celsus already had figured out what was wrong with the church, he thought. He said, you know how we handle things in the, in the Greek political life and culture and social life, he said. He said, the Greeks would say in their life and religions, come, all of you who are of clean hands and pure speech, who are unstained by crime, who have a good conscience, who have done justly and lived uprightly. In other words, Celsus said the Greeks wanted to attract all those who were good and noble and excellent in themselves in every way. He said that was good and that made sense. And then he criticized the Christians. And he wasn't saying this with irony. He was literally meaning this. He said, like all quacks, they gather a crowd of slaves, he said of the Christians. Children, women, and idlers. And they say, come to us, you who are fools, the rogue, the thief, the burglar, the prisoner, the despoiler of temples and tombs. These are the proselytes of the Christians. Jesus, they say, was sent to save sinners. Well, you know, in our old gospel mind, that sounds good to us, right? Jesus is sent to save sinners. He didn't mean it that way. He didn't mean it positively. He meant to say, look at the Christians. They just gather the, the refuse of the culture. Who does that? Celsus. Celsus wouldn't know what to make of Fallon Stubbs. And you probably don't remember Fallon Stubbs. She was 23 years old when she and her mother, Alice Hawthorne, were touring the Olympic Park in Atlanta in 1996. Fallon was hit by the shrapnel of Eric Rudolph's bomb, and her mother, Alice Hawthorne, was killed. But at Eric Rudolph's hearing, Fallon said, because of you, she said, I have become a tolerant person. I forgive you. I look at you, and I love you. And if I cry, it's not for my mother, it's not for my father, it's tears for you. Celsus wouldn't get that. The culture doesn't get that. That's why we're different. Celsus wouldn't know what to make of Nadine Collier. Uh, you'd probably remember her, if not by name, then by action. Her mother was Ethel Lance. And Ethel was 70 years old and attending Bible study at Emmanuel AME Church in South Carolina. When Dylan Roof, in his first court appearance, was having to listen to the families address him. And Collier said to the gunman, You took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never hold her again. But I forgive you. 
and have mercy on your soul. If God forgives you, she said, I forgive you. Both of these women spoke from a place of love, a place that is different than the world, a place that only Jesus could make in the heart of a disciple. And Paul could see that and and describe it in his words so long ago. And now it's our opportunity to live it. It's our opportunity to continue to have a different rule book, a way of being in the world, a way, quite literally, of life, not of death, a way of life. In a few minutes, we're going to gather at the table, and we're going to share in the table of God, and we're going to practice table manners (laughs) in how we share the body and blood of Christ and what Jesus showed us was a way to live in and through and faithfully in the world. And it's just like we teach our daughters at home. We say to them, you need to sit up straight and keep your mouth, your lips closed as you chew and all those things. And we tell them, we're practicing those manners at home so that when you go out, they'll be natural for you. That's what we're doing here. We're practicing these manners here that when we go out, they might be natural. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I have for us a prayer today, as, uh, as Shirley said, uh, Labor Day. It, it, it is significant in so many ways, and in fact, I think sometimes the church's history with Labor Day gets lost, you know? Uh, There was a time when uh, you look even to the early part of the 20th century when uh, people worked or expected to work seven-day work weeks, 10, 12-hour work days. Uh, There weren't laws uh, saying, well, you you, you know, we shouldn't uh, employ children in these dangerous jobs and and things like that. And Methodists actually were at the forefront of of um, some of the radical change that came about from those times. Some of the the very founding of Labor Day itself and and the labor rules uh, that it remembers and celebrates. And so I have a prayer uh, today, not only for those who work, but I also have one for those who are unemployed. Uh, These come from our heart and from our life together as United Methodists. Uh, Before we share our concerns and the other prayers of the day, Will you just join me in prayer? (laughs) O Lord, for those who work, by whom all things are created, Lord, bless all who work daily in home, field, and marketplace. Labor with them until the creation of the new heaven and earth. O God of the vineyard, for those who are unemployed, we know you call us to productive labor, to employ our gifts and talents for you. We pray for those who are unemployed that you would strengthen them in the difficult times, uplift their spirits, and grant them a place among your laborers until all be employed for the common good and we share fully in our true work of praising you with heart and mind and soul forever. Amen. Today we do come before God with these prayers, including uh, prayers you have delivered in the uh, request books. Mary Fond, we thank you for inviting us to pray for Mitch Mason, for Mitch Mason. And also, we pray today at the request of Joe McCreary for Hannah Weimer. And you have in your bulletin many others, and we lift them up together, uh, and we take a moment to see them and pray for them. And when we bring this prayer before God, we bring before God our hearts and our desire to be the people that God uh, described through Paul 
in those beautiful verses. Let us go to God together. God, you have shown us how to love one another, to love the other, to love the enemy. And in doing that, we know we also are showing our love for you. And so we, your people, come before you on this labor weekend to celebrate the many blessings of our lives and the uh, comforts that we enjoy, but to also remember those uh, that don't have comfort at all, especially these hurricane victims, their families, those disaffected, those who have lost jobs and labor as a result of such devastation. We pray that you will continue the great work you have started in recovery and that you will continue to catch us up in that in meaningful ways. And we're so very thankful to be part of your work in the world. Oh God, shape us by your rules, your etiquette, your ways. Help us remember that we follow a Savior who was despised. us to be faithful as a people uh, to the very hard demands that he put. All of this we pray in addition to those we've lifted before you in name and heart and in thought. And we pray together the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're so thankful for all that God has done for us. This is our opportunity to give back to God and share with others. If the acolyte and ushers will come forward, we will receive God's tithes and offerings.
You may be seated. As a people of God, will you join in turning to page 15 of your hymnal, page 15 in the very front. Uh, this, of course, is the communion liturgy offered for us, and today I'll be uh, sharing and praying a prayer for Labor Sunday or Labor Day weekend, a special thanksgiving for this occasion. Uh, that will come with special words where you see red type, and so uh, you join in the bold, follow me for the others, and we'll go to God together. Uh, we have, for your convenience and, um, and for hospitality, gluten-free uh, option. We also will bring the elements to uh, those who cannot uh, come forward on their own. So uh, please let your usher know if you are in that category. And please come before God, for Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a good and fruitful work to give thanks to you, Almighty God, in all places and at all times, and in all tasks. In our cars, our homes, our offices, our fields, and our kitchens, at our tables, our desks, our telephones, and computers. When we are resting or waiting, laboring or supervising, following or leading, all these we do with all your people now on earth. And with all the multitude of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and holy is your work among us in Jesus Christ, who came to be born in the home of a carpenter, a trade he learned and practiced, a laborer in our midst. He called out fishermen and activists. He called the servant of a soldier. He received the support of resourceful women. He delegated his ministry to his disciples and empowered his followers to work divine work in the world. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you gave birth to the church. You delivered us from the bondage of sin and of the power of death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. This is, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as a baptized and commissioned people, remembering your mighty work in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves, our daily lives, and our unique locations for ministry in the world, in homes and hospitals, offices and stores, prisons and schools, as a living and holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. By your Holy Spirit, pour out your spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for us. Thanks be to God.
the blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God. Please come forward as the ushers direct you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks. You have shared yourself with us and shown us how to live in your world as you would have your world be. Grant that we may go into the world to give our strength, your strength to others in the spirit that you have sent us, and that we might be the body of Christ in the world, redeemed by your blood. Amen. Please stand with me, if you are able, and join in singing our hymn number 111, How Can We Name a Love? We have heard the word spoken and proclaimed, and we have shared the table together. Now let us go forward in singing 111.
that verse, our friend and partner's will is better understood, that all should share, create, and care, and know that life is good. May it be so for you and for me, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us go forth. Amen.